Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Blair Embry. I'm the communications manager for Prison Yoga Project, and we are so happy to have you here today to welcome our special guest, Josephine Wickstrom. Thank you so much for being here, Josephine. Thank you so much, Blair. I'm so happy to be here, really. Josephine is an experienced, registered, 500-hour yoga teacher, as well as many, many other trauma and yoga therapy certifications and trainings. Josephine is the program director and training coordinator for Prison Yoga Project Europe. She has been bringing yoga and dance to Swedish prisons since 2008, focusing on trauma-exposed populations. With extensive experience in teaching yoga, she has worked with Prison Yoga Project and conducted training sessions in India and Mexico. Josephine is also involved in developing evidence-based yoga programs for Swedish, Swedish forensic psychi psychiatry units, the juvenile justice system, and stress-reducing programs for children in Swedish schools. She's a trained yoga therapist with a specialization in complex trauma and mental health. She has completed certifications in trauma-sensitive yoga and traumatic stress studies. Incredible resume. And I know that there's so much more to talk about. Thank you so much for being here. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And will you lead us in a centering opportunity before we begin? Yeah, I'm so happy to do that. And uh, tonight I would like to share with you a practice that we do every time when we start our classes inside the forensic psychiatry units here in Sweden. And we call this an arrival sequence, just, you know, to have that transition from whatever you've done previously today to come in and reset so we can have this moment together. So the first invitation is for you to find a comfortable seat. You may also choose to stand up depending on your needs tonight. And then if you want, you can sit at the edge of the chair if you're having a chair that you're sitting on. Let's see if you can start to roll your shoulders up towards your ears a few times to release, you know, common tension that we hold in the muscular muscles here at the top of the shoulders. And feel free to move your shoulders, any rhythm you want, any size of the movement. And then the next time I'm lifting the shoulders up towards my ears, you can try to tense all your muscles in your legs. You may lean forward to feel the weight into your feet and then release the tension. Just notice what happened to your breath. You can try to do that one more time if you want. So tensing the legs, the arms, maybe even the face. And then releasing, letting go. Maybe shaking things out into your arms, into your hands. And then a gentle shoulder roll so you can bring your shoulders up towards your ears and then down the back. Okay, the next is you might want to try to get some energy up into your hands, creating heat into your hands. And I'm in Sweden, so here we're really going to have to go for it <laughs> if you're going to start to create some heat. So notice the feeling in between your hands. See if you can kind of create some space around you. And again, you choose the size of the movement, the rhythm of the movement. Okay, if this felt okay, you can try to do that again. So the felt sensations in between your hands. Okay, and then I'm taking the heat from the hands to release a little bit of tension into the facial muscles, recalling the, the tension chain. You know, when you're stressing around and you're kind of wrinkling your forehead and tensing around your eyes and your jaw, as we do as the days goes by. You might want to move the jaw a little bit side to side. And then if it feels okay for your arms and shoulders, you may want to try to give a little bit of a massage here at the top of the shoulders, at the side of the neck. Then moving out into the arms. So noticing that the pressure of the hands towards the arms kind of 
sensing the boundary of where your body is together with the hands, the pressure of the hands. And then I'm interlacing my hands and I'm kind of pushing the palms of the hands forward and rounding the back. See if you can release some tension in between your shoulder blades. And then releasing so the arms are coming to the sides and a little sequence here so you can roll the shoulders up towards your ears and just letting go. Maybe one more time if you want. Maybe a gentle shoulder roll this time. The final little movement, so moving side to side. Ah, and see if you can find a stretch here at the side of the chest. And you may have want to have your arm up or down, so you can find a, an alternative there, and you can move a little bit side to side. Just as a transition, we've been walking around all day doing different things. Depending on where we are, you might be in the early morning, <laughs> Sonia. <laughs> so maybe this is an evening good night stretch. And coming all the way up. And the final time to the other side. Okay. And then a little moment in silence. We keep the silence very short. And of course, you can keep your eyes open or closed. You may want to allow your eyes to move in the room to notice. What you see on your right side and on your left side. And if it feels good for you, you may keep your eyes closed. You can continue with the eyes open anytime. And now is it possible to release the tension in your face and your shoulders, maybe even out into your arms and your hands? Perhaps noticing the pressure from the chair towards your hips and the feet connected to the floor. Just 10 seconds longer. Maybe you want to continue to release this tension chain that we normally hold. And then you can roll the shoulders up and maybe lift your arms up. And if you want, you can close your hands to see, to get some energy for this webinar. <laughs> and then lift your arms out maybe to the side and the other side. And just releasing. <laughs> Thank you, Blair. <laughs> That was so great. Thank you. I could feel a yawn coming at the end. And I, was, oh, I saw you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am relaxed. It's actually very common when you're starting to get into these kind of sighing uh, that people also get into yawning. So. Mm -hmm. What is your first memory of yoga? I have, actually have a really strong memory from the first time I practiced yoga. Um, it's a really long story. I'm going to try to keep it a little bit short, but I, I ended up in India when I was 18 after a long period of chaos in my life. So I come from a complex trauma background with hyper arousal symptoms and I had flashbacks and panic attacks. Um, and as soon as I was 18, I was like, right, I'm going to get out of Sweden. I have to go travel a little bit like escaping everything that I had uh, in my youth. And finally, I ended up in India and um, I was really hyper aroused. And there was this guy in, in New Delhi. He looked at me and he said, you know, he was really annoyed because I was in a in a restaurant. And he said, you know, you have to be yo do yoga. <laughs> so... <laughs> Because uh, he was really annoyed, I was talking too loud and I was just too much, you know. So I actually did. I took him on his word and I went to Rishikesh in north of India and I tried a yoga class. And in the beginning, I was like, what are they talking about? I had really struggling with my breath and I felt really, I had a really hard time in the beginning. 
but I remembered when I took my first deep breath because I had the reverse breathing patterns from all the all the stress that I had. So my first memory was like uh, when I managed to get the breathing down into my belly that I was a little bit overwhelmed because it made me realize that for the first time in my life, I was able to relax. So it was a bit scary, but it was also like a big relief at the same time. So a lot of emotions came up. Um, so I, I really felt that this landed really deeply in me. And uh, then I, I continued with yoga, but, you know, on and off uh, coming in and out of the yoga practice like that, as you do when you're young. But uh, I had that really strong memory of kind of really taking my first big deep breath and feeling the effects from it. What a beautiful and a heartbreaking experience. Yeah. The realization. When did it become a really strong path for you? On and off. <laughs> I was, you know, going into these more destructive patterns in my life when I was younger as well. So, but around when I was 21, I think the the practice kind of took hold of me much more. I felt that um I started to get that interoceptive uh, ability. So I started to feel that um, whatever I did on the side that was not so good for me, that that didn't land well in my body anymore. And I started to get very tired of myself. Mm -hmm. And I also felt that this was not the path I was supposed to be on. And I also had this beautiful yoga teacher in India who kept on bringing me back to the yoga. Like, no, no, you're not supposed to go that way. You, you gotta, you have much more potential than destroying yourself like that. So he was a really, really, really huge source for me to actually go deeper into the yoga practice. And so around 2021, uh, I started to get into more uh, regular practice and really deep diving into the philosophy and because it really landed in me from the beginning, like the, the concept of freedom, right? So, mm. And how does that, what's the in-between? What's the story of you finding yoga in your late teens? And then now for 15 years, you've been going into prisons and offering yoga. How did you find this work? Uh, so since I have those experiences in my background and I also felt, you know, because I, I was really, I was really a mess. Like I had, a, I had severe issues when I was younger. And when I felt that the yoga was so powerful in myself, of course, I felt that this, this practice, that's a privilege, uh, in most parts of the world because it's really expensive. I really also felt that, um, this practice is there to share with people who maybe came from the same experiences as me, but don't have the access, right? So a big part of my uh, kind of drive into the work comes from there. But the way I kind of got into all the trauma work was by so-called coincidence. It's like uh, meetings <laughs> uh, in different places that led me into different projects. Uh, but the prison work was a strong calling because I felt that if I could feel, you know, a sense of balance and a sense of freedom and a sense of um, kind of arriving into who I am, you know, at the deepest core, not what I have done, like my actions, I separated that from what I felt deep inside of me. If I could have that insight, maybe this would be a good tool to bring inside the prisons. So I came back from India after many, many years in India, and I just called the, the women's prison where I ended up by chance because I met a boyfriend in India who was living nearby two of the biggest prisons in Sweden and their maximum security prisons for women and men. So I was like, OK, I'm right in between. <laughs> I have this knowledge. So I called them. And when I called them, they just had a meeting that they were looking for a dance teacher. And I'm also a dance teacher. And I said, maybe we could also bring some yoga. And I was like, great, just come and try, you know. So it was like tick, tick, tick like that. So, uh, yeah. And, and maybe it is like this path of liberation that does open doors, like paired with practice and commitment. But I feel like this is a similar seed to so many people that I interview and so many people in this work that it just, that it opens or that mm -hmm. there's all of these coincidences. Right. And, um, it's amazing. Yeah. And then of course, when I came to the prison, I was like, I was so nervous. My lip was up here and I was like, Oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> like, <laughs> It went well, it went well, but you know, like the initial, like, yeah, this is so great. And they're like, Ooh, how am I going to do this? <laughs> 
because now we have a community with prison yoga project like we support each other we have trainings like then we had i was kind of uh coming from no no experience right so um yeah <laughs> yeah okay so going in on your own starting this program and will you tell us how you grew your program in sweden Yeah, so basically I was really lucky because I got inside the women's prison at the same time. Uh, My colleague, Eva Seilis, she's the founder of the national Swedish yoga project called Krim Yoga in the prisons. She was starting to develop this program and she heard about me in Hinseberg. So she contacted me and asked, do you want to collaborate to expand this project and also train the guards to become yoga teachers? Because... I was really lucky. I got in as an external yoga teacher, but they stopped that because of security reasons and also economy. So I got the chance to develop this program from the beginning together with her. And she's a Kripalu teacher. So we have so much in common, right? So, and I was already working with trauma for many, many years before I started inside the prison in India. So I worked with children and, and women there. So I got the chance to kind of build this program from the start together with her. And then we did did the largest uh, randomized research in the world on our program. And it's uh, it's now evidence-based program, but we did that in collaboration with the the researchers and also a program in in the UK that did it previously. So we kind of remodeled the program and then did it in Sweden. So, So that's how it went. And I did that now, the work for... 16 years, basically. And now I finally, I stopped training the guards because that's a national program. It runs on its own, but I'm still inside the prisons. Yeah. How many programs do you facilitate a week in the prison? No one believes me when I'm saying this, but I have, I have 25 classes a week inside the maximum security prison for men. And I have a little bit more, not so regular in the women's, but once or twice a month I go there and then I have six classes a week. So it's depending on I'm doing a project there right now. It's a bit more far from where I live. Yeah. Incredible. So it's, you're able to serve hundreds of people each week is what that sounds like. Yeah. We have 218 guys in the, in the program. (laughs) Absolutely incredible. So have you okay? So you, you talked about this maximum security prison, and this is kind of ushering us into the larger conversation. Um, what other facilities and populations have you served over the years? So I've been in many different environments. So we've been working also inside the juvenile justice system here in Sweden and developing programs for them that's trauma informed. Also, they're training the staff to get them on board. But there we had uh, trained ex-incarcerated people. So we trained them to be yoga teachers, to go inside and do the classes. Because I felt that, you know, someone who was walking their talk uh, reached this youth much more on a deeper level. So that's a still ongoing program. We're calling it. It's an inside job from the slogan that we have from (laughs) Prison Yoga Project. Uh, training some of the guys also you know more like regulation uh, methods not so long yoga classes but we still train them to work with youth so that's one program and then we got the chance um, in 2018 to start to develop a program inside the forensic psychiatry units Uh, and that's where you go if you're kind of condemned to be too sick uh, to be in a regular prison to do your punishment for those of you who don't know what that is so and that ties us into the theme of today and that answers my next question is what is forensic psychiatry and how is it different than other forms of psychiatry so i I work also inside the psychiatric units inside the prisons. Um, So to kind of explain the differences between the psychiatric units in an open, like normal prison and the forensic psychiatry. So when you're, when you've done the crime, if you're being kind of uh, too sick at that moment, then you go to the forensic psychiatry. But if you're in a prison and you develop like psychosis afterwards, then you go to uh, the prison hospital like the psychiatric unit right and if you continue to be 
too ill, then they send you to the forensic psychiatry. So the difference of working with the psychiatry inside the prisons, there they are not so medicated, but in the forensic psychiatry, they get medication for their um, kind of mental health in many different levels. So that's also affecting, right, what we're doing inside our programs. So the most common um, diagnoses are schizophrenia, severe PTSD, psychosis, bipolar symptoms or syndrome. And, you know, like many also comorbid um, diagnoses like GAD, anxiety. Uh, so it's, it's really complex to work. And in one person, there can be so many different comorbid um, kind of symptoms, right? So it's a really, really tough environment to to work with in and it's also very hard to motivate them and and go into treatments and so on so yeah thank you for differentiating that as well i didn't even know what this was when i first came to prison yoga project and i think that just speaks to um the expansiveness of what our criminal justice system is, whether it's in the United States or states or at like a global level. Um, So can you talk to us about why yoga is a really great complementary therapeutic program or offering for these populations? Mm -hmm. It's just like we've seen, it's just such an amazing tool on so many different levels because First of all, there is not so much activities depending on which hospital you are uh, situated in. And many have a hard time, you know, even getting out of bed, uh, movement problems. And also when you're really heavily medicated with uh, antipsychotic drugs, uh, you, 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 you gain a lot of weight normally. And, you know, it's really hard to, to go to maybe a so-called normal physical exercise where you kind of do spinning or playing football or anything like that. So yoga can also bring, you know, physical activity on a more kind of gentle level. Uh, But most of all, what we see is also that when we are practicing yoga together, there is a chance for this group, you know, to move together, to breathe together and to be in this really, really take a lot of care to create a safe space. Um, and also, you know, when we're training, we're also training the staff inside the, the these units. So they already know about their patients. They know about the common reactions and they also know how to meet them where they are in their reality. So it's important to remember when we're working with psychosis and schizophrenia and like that, that they have their own reality. So there's many different realities that we have to acknowledge. Um, so with the yogic concepts, when we're talking about Vidya and Avidya here, the, for me, what's Avidya is Vidya, like uh, seeing clearly from another point. So, so here we can all meet in this kind of reality of moving and breathing and also getting, you know, a kind option. You may want to use this one or that one for many of them. They never had that in their life because they come from so much complex trauma and and psychiatric uh, you know bullying and yeah violence in their home and everything so for many of them it's also new to get that kind of gentleness um, on top of the regulation skills that they get as a practical you know how to to deal and handle their everyday life in these environments that's really it's really closed environments you know it's a maximum security most of the time uh, then they go to more open units. And when starting to being released to society again, it's like many different levels to go out. So this is a real preparation for how you can be social, how you can start to regulate your strong emotions and your reactions and your behaviors on a very practical level that they didn't encounter before. So that's just a few of the benefits. It's just I'm, I'm amazed of how well this is landing, you know, so... And I want to hear about more of the benefits as we continue to expand the conversation. I'm interested in hearing about the staff. Are hmm. are the staff, are they therapists? Are they nurses? Are they correctional officers? What is the background of the staff and what is their role in supporting their patients? Hmm. So they are nurses. They are um 
how do you say physiotherapists? Uh, they are so they are not really correctional staff, but they're trained as you know for security wise. They have alarms and everything like in a normal prison, but they have their their own clothes sometimes on. They have or nurses clothes on depending on the units you're in. Um, we also have psychologists that joining the program and also facilitating the classes. So it's a mix of kind of healthcare pers- personnel. Um, and what is really amazing is that, of course, they're also getting the benefit because they are practicing together with the patients, the men and the women inside these units. Uh, so they feel the effects from the yoga practice. And what is super amazing is that the power dynamics is really equalized. Because they're struggling together, right? And the the men and the women inside these units, they also show a lot of compassion for the staff because sometimes they're also new to guiding a little bit of these movements. So they get a bit insecure and shy. So the guys and the women are like, no, come on, you can do this. Like, this is great, you know? So it's like, a, it's a really beautiful kind of closure of like how they can like interact and it gets, provides them a more humane kind of environment I feel. Hmm. And so I think that that's something that's really unique about this study and this program. And maybe you could talk about it more is that you're teaching them yoga, mindfulness, meditation together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to the benefits for both the patient and the facilitator, what else have you seen through this study that has amazed you? So we haven't seen the results yet. Uh, so <laughs> I should be more quiet, but like I'm not biased at all. <laughs> like I'm like, go, go, go. It's gonna be great, you know. So, but um we have we have some feedback from patients that I, I go around and I do kind of quality checks for the for the teachings, and I also meet the men and the women and I ask like how is it going, you know, and um what is the best thing with the yoga practice? And I got this really amazing guy that I met a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, I'm I'm really struggling with voices in my head. I have voice hallucinations. And when I go to a yoga class, it's like I'm on flight mode, airplane mode. It's like the voices stop for one hour and I can completely relax and I can arrive inside myself on a totally different level. And I never had that for many, many, many years. So the yoga for me, it's like a holiday from all of that that goes on. So I really like that flight mode uh, uh, statement. Yeah. Incredible. It's really incredible. Um, we have another. Can I just continue talking? <laughs> I'm just talking. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we have another one. Um, he was on, you know, a short leave to start to practice to go out into society again. And he was suffering from panic attacks. So he tried to go to the food food store. So he gets panic attacks and then he gets really violent and acting out. And so he becomes a little bit dangerous when he gets his panic attacks, right? So that's why he ended up in the forensic psychiatry. So he calls his nurse, which was his yoga facilitator. Ah, Penilla, 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 do you know what happened? <laughs> I went to the food store and I started to feel my, my energy go up. As you said, I pulled my shoulders up and I tensed my face like we did here in the beginning, right? To feel how you can relax and get into the ground and everything. So he started to feel this building up and he said, I went into the toilet and I did share pose and I was pushing forward and I did the breaths inside the po- inside the toilets. And then I came out, I went to get my cinnamon, cinnamon buns and I went out and it was fine. <laughs> so it's like, uh, you can, yeah, so he could really use it um, like now in his transition going out into society again. And she was, of course, like, wow, you know, that's amazing that you could use these uh, short practices to really regulate and and notice when this is coming up, because that is really big, you know. That's huge. Like when I hear that, I immediately see these are life-saving skills. Yeah, it's really, yeah. Right, because maybe it's different from Sweden, but I mean, I feel like in... America, the state that it is, someone has a panic attack, they act out violently. 
they could they could end up dead by someone, by the police, something, right? And so to have the experience, to have these tools of self-regulation literally is life-saving. Yeah, it is. It's really is. And also, you know, keeping it real, I, I want to talk about that every time when we talk about these severe and complex issues like schizophrenia and severe PTSD and everything. It's not like we're going to cure or, you know, use this as a single treatment, but it can be complementary to other treatments because it's so empowering that you don't need to reach for external things to kind of manage your life, uh, but it can provide you, you know, with this kind of stability in life. And so you can move forward with, with you know, a little bit of self-confidence as well, that you can you can control yourself. You still need to take your medication. You still need to go to your, your psychologist. You need still to be in the healthcare system. But now you have some tools that's not external. You, you have it in here. And for someone who's been in this environment, it's like the lowest part you can be in society. It's like a nightmare for many people if you're ending up in this place and to, you know, to build up a self-confidence and a, a sense of, you know, courage as well to be able to go out and also encounter other people. Uh, I think that's that's where we can use these practices because it's 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 real and it's it's in ourselves and we can we can do it anywhere. You don't have to be on a yoga mat or in a fancy yoga studio. You can it's like a real real life skills, right? So that allows them to continue to live. Like yeah. he can now go to the grocery store. He can mm-hmm. now go and be in public and live his life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, you know, and again, you you gotta like the yoga. <laughs> you gotta go to the yoga regularly and you're gonna continue to do these small things, right? To keep it in check. Uh, but uh yeah, it's it's really beautiful to see those who really catch these practices and they use them in their life. So So one of the things that I'm really excited about sharing with our community, because we do have a large community of facilitators. So, you know, Prison Yoga Project will talk as like an umbrella. We offer trauma-informed framework. So the yoga that we offer in prisons to system-impacted people, maybe in substance use or substance use recovery centers, the wide range of places that we have prison yoga uh, programming, um, is different than studio yoga. And so I'm also imagining that facilitating inside in these places with a specific population, that facilitation looks different. Will you talk to us about the difference of facilitating in these spaces? Mm -hmm. First of all, like we need to be pretty kind of taking precautions for people who have movement um, difficulties. Uh, So inside the units, inside the prisons, many of the guys, they are really physical, like they're training a lot and they're doing all of these uh, exercises on a normal, regular basis. But here they're not so used to moving around and they have a lot of also weight uh, issues and and injuries and everything. But most, most of all, we need to train to be able to see when someone is triggered because it's much more easily triggered in these environments. So we, we who are facilitating inside the forensic psychiatry, we know how to read the signs, you know, someone starting to breathe high up. We also know how to bring into regulation skills into the group to bring them back into the window of tolerance. Or if you see someone is starting to collapse, you need to bring the energy up. So it's kind of that modulating the same as we do inside our normal classes in the prison, but here we need to hold the container even more. And we also need to be very clear with our instructions and we also use less alternatives um, because it can be really hard to do an alternative. So like an A, B choice is the maximum almost that we do like rhythm and size and everything. But after a while you can, you can bring more of that inside. Um, but being also really clear that people will dissociate on a much um, severe level. So sometimes you really lose someone. So you learn skills of bringing people back into getting some rhythm into the group that can really help if someone is dissociating and doing large movements like rhythmically together. 
that normally snaps the person out to get them back into uh, the group rhythm again. So that's really powerful. And then we do grounding practices if we start to see someone is breathing high up and getting red in their faces and everything to feel your feet, you know, exhaling longer, tensing and releasing can be really good tools to kind of bring the general level down to to a regulated state again. So it's much more kind of that um, seeing and working and yeah. It's, I'm hearing that it's so much about being present that you're constantly tracking the room. Really, really constantly tracking the room. And also for us, uh, that's facilitating that we, um, especially when I'm teaching also, I, and my my regular classes is inside the prison psychiatric units. That's my where I teach most. But it, it mirrors where we are in the forensic psychiatry as well, that I do my own grounding sequence before I start to facilitate, you know, trying to relax my face and my shoulders and my breath and my hands, everything that kind of can uh, remind them of a threat, you know, like if I hold my shoulders up or if I'm like tense like that and I'm bringing my nose up like that, that can be really threatening. So I'm trying to be as relaxed as I can to relax the nervous systems of them. So the concept of grounding and centering is like a constant in myself as well, that I need to do my own practice to be able to, to do these classes as well. And the same for the staff, they learn how to do this nonviolent communication, you know, breathing slow, talking slow, uh, not to, not to kind of trigger anything even further. Ooh, that makes me kind of want to go on a, a little bit of a, a, oh, okay. go, a go, side go. tangent. <laughs> what is your routine for like pre-facility, pre-prison? What's your centering or grounding? And I, I do it in between classes as well. I make sure I have, even though I have 25 classes a week, I make sure that I take a seat. And I feel my feet to the floor, firmly to the ground. And I start to actually activate my feet a little bit. So sometimes I even give some massage under my feet to give a clear pressure under my feet to really ground myself. And I also do like I'm tensing the right side of my body, exhaling, releasing the left side of my body. It's the same regulation skills that I'm using with the women and the men that I'm meeting. Then I make sure to tense my whole body to screen if I'm holding unnecessary tension when I'm releasing. Sometimes we have like a millimeter of tension up here. So can I release that? I do a little bit of this, you know, releasing my facial muscles. Then I tend to sit still and just breathing from the ground all the way up to the crown of my head. Exhaling really long, releasing the face, the shoulders, the belly, the hands, feeling the ground. And I repeat that a few times. Sometimes it's only like five breaths. It's like five minutes. And then I feel, okay, I'm here now. So now we can let them in. Mm. Have the, so you've been doing this work for years. Has there been an, uh, uh, an experience where you felt triggered or something happened in not necessarily even a class, um, maybe walking into a facility, walking out of a facility? Um, and how did you handle it? I had a few, I mean, if you're working in psychiatric, so I work with uh, acute psych psychosis. So they are actually in a psychosis with not medicated sometimes inside the psychiatric units. And uh, I haven't really been scared, but I felt like, okay, how will I handle this situation? Because a person really got into acting out uh, what he, he got really paranoid. And he had a problem with uh, kind of regulating himself and he started to get really scared. And th this guy is called the little man and he's like over two meters long <laughs> and he stands always beside me. And of course I have an alarm and there is a guards around and everything, but I didn't want to make a big thing out of this, but I, I start to feel him getting more and more agitated and he never wants to have his face into the group. He always wanted to look at the wall because he always he felt safe like that. And the rest of the group, they had their faces in towards me. So I tried to kind of keep me regulated while I was teaching that class. And I started to hear him getting more and more agitated. And he started to talk more and more loud. So I was like, okay, 
let's acknowledge that something is happening here. So I was like, okay, little man, this practice is for you. Let's see if we can use our voices a little bit. So we did this. I was like, ah, you know, pushing out. And yeah, I got to use his voice. So after a while, he got uh, more regulated because it increased his kind of exhale and everything. But it took a long time. And I asked the guys, is it okay if we use some sound in here? Is it okay for you guys? And the rest was like, yeah, yeah, let's let's do it, you know. But it took some time for him to calm down. And then I felt, you know, okay. <laughs> but I was really close to kind of getting help for um, making sure that he was safe. I I felt safe in the moment, but afterwards I was a bit shaky because I felt that, okay, that could have, that could have happened, um, something. But all the time I have staff there and I have the other guys helping me, but he would... I knew this guy and I felt safe enough that he wouldn't attack me or anything. He's not, he never done anything violent to another person, but I was more scared of his own, his health. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it also just talks about the importance of you being centered and grounded because you didn't trigger him by a reaction. You used what, he was doing of his behavior and you incorporated it into the group and you're like, this is okay. Let's use this. So then it went that time it went good, you know, so, but you never know. It's like the, every situation is unique. Uh, But I've been using also, you know, tennis balls. I'm allowed to bring tennis balls inside. So if that happens, if someone is getting really kind of showing psychotic symptoms and really hyper aroused, we have tennis balls beside the yoga mats so then we put a tennis ball under their feet and rubbing their feet. And that tends to get the, the hyper arousal down really quickly. And also if you're feeling out of yourself, you know, it, as in a psychotic symptoms and you're starting to feel like you're dissociating, this is really grounding. So I've been using those techniques as well to, to really put pressure on a kind of round object like that. So, um, yeah. I want to do that. I, I bet that feels really good. It feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that also makes me, I, I I just, I could ask you questions about your work all day. Do you meet with the staff? Do you know more about their background? Do you know more about like their medication or potential symptoms or what they're suffering with or from? Like how much information do you know as the facilitator? I, I don't want to know so much, but yeah. we do we always do like a security evaluation before they come to yoga class. So if they are really violent, like outward going violent towards other people, I don't work with them basically. So we, I also collaborate with the psychologists in the, in the prison. So she also does that evaluation. So I know, I always know that the people I work with would, would not be violent towards me. Right. And I, I don't want to know about what I have done previously. It's not, it's not important for me because what I, I'm there to meet the human being who is in front of me at that given moment. And it would be some, some of the men and the women I work with are also in the media. Um, so it kind of comes up, but I feel that the yoga practice and what we're doing together brings us to this equal stance like neutral place anyhow you know the concept of samastitihi as we say in the yoga practice coming back to neutral has been you know a constant reminder that okay we are here we are neutral we are that's that's where we start you know this is where we meet and medication sometimes if it would be relevant to the practices that i'm giving if someone has uh, maybe a lot of adhd medicine and their pulse is going up or but normally it's Normally, I don't know so much about that. Thank you. So we started a little bit on this. What are the practical aspects of implementing trauma-informed yoga in these clinical settings? So when you, okay, let's, let's do this. When you train facilitators, what are some of these basic aspects that you first speak to we when we train the facilitators i'm really lucky to do that together with my colleague eva eva right so we all we have a 
common history of working inside the prisons together. So we come from that experience. And also James has been helping us with this, by the way. So he's been in Sweden in the forensic psychiatry facilitating classes with us. So we kind of bring what we know from working with people coming from trauma, being in confined environments, which is, I find it's very different to work with trauma in environments where you cannot leave. Lack of control, safety and predictability. And on top of that, shame, grief, anger, frustration. So it's so many layers to work. So that's where we start. We talk about trauma. We educate the staff about complex trauma issues and how it's in the body. What we need to take in consideration when we work with an autonomic nervous system that's affected and maybe unbalanced. We talk about the window of tolerance And here we really work a lot with, you know, what happens if someone falls out of the window, if someone is out of the reach of their capacity, right? So learning, teaching the staff to to see when someone is triggered and to educate them with good and effective tools and methods to bring them down. So that's where we work most. And then a practical level, they need to start to feel the practices in their own bodies and do self-reflection, you know, and start to facilitate with each other and they practice the videos and everything. But the trauma, trauma theory is super important and how the body holds the trauma. And then we add the extra layer. So what happened also if you have schizophrenia and psychosis, what do we need to take in consideration there? Because it's a unique neurobiology when we work with uh, psychosis. As Schizophrenia has too much dopamine, for example. So we... The medicine is counteracting that. So we want to avoid too much triggering practices that can increase the dopamine too fast because it can be too much then. So we have to consider that as well, right? Uh So it's like working with a unique, unique biology on top of the layers of trauma and everything else that's going on. So we also specialize towards the most common needs inside the forensic psychiatrist. It's like its own kind of little method going on. Yeah. Incredible. Can you elaborate on co-regulation and its significance in breaking the cycle of trauma? And Mm. how do you train individuals to co-regulate and respond to trauma in a healthy way? Wow, this is the most difficult part because many are coming from complex, complex, complex relational issues, right? Coming from trauma. So co-regulating. So you can imagine that we're kind of unsynced we're not synced it's like you fall out of a beat when you have been carrying these complex trauma and severe trauma issues for a long time so many people say that i feel out of sync and when you then get into a group and you start to get synchronized with other people you know without you having a pressure on you doing that that brings in a co-regulation into the group naturally and you work with that for quite some time to get them to feel uh, safe and secure in that kind of environment. Um, But it's so important that facilitators like staff or in other places we're going in as yoga teachers inside prisons, that if we're going to co-regulate with someone, we need to be regular, we need to be safe, and we also need to be predictable. So it's important that the same person is there week by week, because that's going to help the security systems in the the people we work with and in ourselves because we are co-regulating together with them. Uh, And sometimes it can be out of sync for quite some time, but it's a very beautiful moment when you start to feel how you're starting to co-regulate. Like my nervous system is impacting your nervous system and we're doing this together like a dance. And all of a sudden it's kind of syncing up, you know, and that's where we feel that, okay, now we are here and we're kind of meeting each other on a more deeper level. It's not about, what medication you take, what crimes you did, what what you carry with you from your childhood. It's more about that kind of interaction that we're getting. And actually, there is another guy that I talked to inside the forensic psychiatry, and he said, because the mimic in their faces from the antipsychotic medicine is like we co-regulate with facial expressions as well. We smile and we nod and everything, and that's not really there. So he said that he felt like he was in a bubble, couldn't reach out. That we work a lot with the facial muscles, like massaging and doing all of this 
we start to move and we breathe and we get the vagal tone up and we, we start to get the, the autonomic nervous system more in balance. And after a while, he said, you know, ah, I start to feel, you know, like now when I talk, it feels like I reach out. There is something different. I feel more relaxed over here and I feel my voice is different. So it's like, oh, okay, this is great. You know, like he felt connected. And I also feel that that's a part of the kind of rhythmical dance we do together. And actually they showed in a research that the plasma oxytocin in groups of uh, patients with schizophrenia was three times more than the control group, as like in the yoga group, than the control group. Um, so there's something about the relaxation response, of course, less cortisol, but I also think it's that kind of synchronizing moving because we don't touch, right? We don't, that's the normal way to get, we, we touch each other. So it can get like, not each other, but themselves, this can give an increase in oxytocin, especially if you're touching over here and here and gives more rise of oxytocin. But I, I feel that that's. And we stand in a half circle. So you have someone here is not too much in front. So I think that's contributing to this kind of sense of not so isolated anymore. It's incredible. And I just continue to hear how complex yeah. this work is. Yeah. And really just how present one needs to be and really just skilled in facilitating and having tools on deck to be able to use because you're so present and you're responding to what's happening in the room. This will be my last question I ask you before we head into some question and answer. But if someone was interested in doing this work or they're already facilitating in prisons and they're interested in reaching new populations, what are a couple steps that you would recommend for a facilitator to do or where to study and start this work? I would, I would really actually recommend if you want to work in the forensic psychiatry that you, you, you can become trained in that field because what we notice when we train the staff that they, they already know all of that. They have like the, they know how to work with these patients. They have that background. So that would be the opt, optimal, right? To, to al already have that healthcare background and then go deeper into the yoga therapy field or to do a longer training within yoga therapy, of course, get the license to become a yoga therapy with a special interest of mental health. Uh, there is a really good school in London from Heather Mason. It's called the Minded Institute. And they also cover schizophrenia and psychosis and everything. So they are really renowned. So I feel like a yoga therapy uh, license coupled with prison yoga project, 200 hours training, that would be a good match if you want to work with these kind of more complex issues. Um, otherwise, we have that beautiful training that's designed for working inside prison. So I, I rec recommend our 200 hour training, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And we have a foundational training as well. Okay. And that's yeah. a little less than a 40 hour training. And this brings you through the history of incarceration, uh, the impact of trauma, the impact of trauma, incarceration and yoga. Uh, and we'll drop the link in the description for this podcast as well. Um, but thank you so much. And we have some questions already starting to come in, but now is the time and the benefit of joining us live is that you get to ask our amazing guests questions. Um, and so to our folks in the audience right now, how to submit a question. I'm going to have you do that through the Q&A box. So if you look at their Zoom screen, there's a bar at the bottom and it says Q&A and you can put your questions into this space and we'll start here and you can start to put your questions in now. Um, first question that we have, I'm curious to know how the system itself approves for the staff to participate in the program, i.e. giving them the time during their day to do this. Here in Australia, while we teach the classes, it essentially gives the officers a bit of relief or respite from taking care of so many people. Mm. The cue over here has been that is sorely needed, like new intervention for both staff and the patients inside the forensic psychiatry, but we also have research. So we are, we're having an ongoing national research program inside the forensic psychiatry units. 
So it's the first in the world, actually, what we're doing here in Sweden, which is amazing for we're working with trauma-informed yoga for these kind of environments. So that has also been super helpful for getting these programs inside because we also need evidence behind us when we're working in the healthcare system, because this is not under the prison system. This is under the healthcare system. And the same in the in the prison system. We need to have hard evidence to be able to bring these practices in. And I think it's really good because it's multiple yoga styles that could trigger a lot in populations like this. You know, going in with a fire breath for someone who has uh, schizophrenia, that could be super triggering. But we managed to get the same amazing research team behind our backs as we did in the in the Swedish prison system. And that's been helping to open the doors because then they want to be a part of doing a real evaluation. How can we work with this? And to find a model, you know, we need to research it as well. So that's been the door opener for many, many places. But the time is ripe. You know, we've been working with this for so many years. And the, the previous research we did, that's been also a major door opener because we had some amazing, significant results in the Swedish research. So that's how we how we managed. <laughs> Where can people find the research results? There you can find, you can search for yoga in correctional settings. Um, It's called, that's the research. You can find it under yoga gives potential. I can, how can we find this? Um, I can, there's three different separate um, research articles. Could we put them up somewhere? I could try to find them. Yeah. So through the recording in the podcast description, post this event, we'll be able to link the three. Perfect. If you want me to do a quick Google search right now, I could see if I could find we'll post it afterwards in the link. We'll yeah. yeah, that's okay, perfect. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, and so we're seeing some comments here uh from Dr. Lacey, I'm a licensed clinical and forensic psychologist at a state psychiatric hospital. I've completed a 200-hour trauma-informed yoga teacher training program. My boss would be open to implementing this at our hospital. Yes, this is why we do this. She would most likely want to read some of the research. Could you list references to be shared or PDF of the articles? Yes. Okay. So we're working on that. Absolutely. Um, And in our local corrections program. Incredible. Incredible. Amazing. And we will for sure send you an article about our ongoing research. And, and you can also contact Professor Nora Kerikis, who is the lead researcher as well. She is our P- PYP researcher for Europe. So she does a lot of research for us. Okay. Uh, we can also make sure that information is shared and email contact as well. I'll drop my email and I can connect everyone who needs to be connected. Amazing. This is why this is the best. I love coming. (laughs) Perfect. Next question. Can you speak more about using the group experience, bio, psycho, social aspect to the ground versus the individual experience? I think we're missing this crucial aspect of our work, the group. Uh, So the importance of being inside a group. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's get if you know, some are also having social anxiety. (laughs) <laughs> so we also have individual clients, but what we're noticing in the group environment, that's so powerful. We have so many kind of cognitive uh, treatment interventions inside the psychiatry where you get to talk a lot. You have group interventions also with talking about your trauma and your mental health. But this is unique because you get to move with people. And as we all know, from the beginning of the human history, we have been synchronized and we've been dancing, we've been moving together. And sometimes I feel that is lost in our kind of modern society where isolated units with our mobile phones, uh, we always, there's so much, you know, loneliness, especially here in Sweden, I think in the rest of the world, you know, a sense of loneliness. So being in that group together, synchronizing and moving I don't know if you have have done yoga together with people for some time. You never talk to the person, but it feels like you know them. It feels like you know the person who's been there on the yoga mat beside you. So it does something to us that, and I know Bessel van der Kolk, uh, the body keeps the score. He talks about this a lot, 
the importance of tuning and moving and getting that group support as well. And what we're noticing inside these units, they have their special places in the group where they have their mats. If someone is missing, it's not the same. It's like a beat missing. And they let that person know, like, where were you? There was an empty space. So you also feel that you've been seen, you've been missed, and you're a part of something that's kind of beyond the words, beyond who you are as a unit. Here you have a chance to to synchronize and to feel that power of the group. And when you start to drop into a relaxation together with other people, that means also you have a fearless meeting, right? And there is so much fear and so much uh, tension that we build up so unnecessary. And especially here when you come from relational trauma issues, that's it's kind of automatically built in. And here you get a chance to un- unravel that in a, in a safe way. So, And this is a really great question and a beautiful response. And I'd speak to it as well as that. I feel like this is really the foundation of our work is relationship. And then it's yoga is after mm-hmm. that, right? Like there is um, such an incredible opportunity that happens when we carve out space to be Mm -hmm. together. Um, And we have people that have been isolated from their families, their loved ones, and it has been done on purpose. So to reestablish relationship, and like you've talked about having a long history of um, traumatic relationships, potentially, um, this is really an opportunity to bring in a a healing aspect, in addition to all of the benefits that yoga provides us. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. More questions. I love that we have a full box of questions. <laughs> Do the staff in the room tend to intervene when things are getting a little shaky with the participants or do they let you handle it and continue with the practice? I've been working for so many years, like this is almost 16 years inside the prisons and I know the staff really well. So we we, we collaborate. Mm-hmm. I have the most beautiful staff that I work with uh, inside the prisons where I facilitate they know that we have a sign. Like if I'm working in the psychiatry unit, I give a sign to them. And they also have cameras. So if I start to feel that something is escalating and I need their presence, I have a special sign that I show for the camera or then they come and walk past and make sure everything is fine. But then I have an alarm as well. So I push the alarm, but I, I've never pushed the alarm in my life, only by mistake, actually, when the guys were in meditation and the s- squat team is coming. <laughs> it was me putting my chin on the alarm. <laughs> but the staff um, inside the male prison, they leave me alone. They know we have that sign. But inside the women's prison, we have also staff joining the classes. So they are practicing yoga together. So that's a part of the routine. We don't have anyone watching the classes. They are always participating. And I know it's not the same for other kinds of programs, but I mean, I feel like that's just incredible that there's never been an issue. You've been doing this work for 15 years and oh, never, never, yeah. never an issue. And I think it also speaks to the, I'm bringing in a couple of pieces. Like I think it speaks to the neutrality of the work that we offer um, so that we don't come in necessarily as enemies of anyone. And it's so much about relationships. Like you talking about that you have a sign and a signal and staff mm-hmm. is in class. Um, mm-hmm. And so again, just talking to the relationships um, and the relationship building of this work, I think is integral. I think it's important because sometimes when you work inside prison, it's like they they want us, to, you know, the us and them mentality that we have built relationships also with the staff and also with the, the people we have in our classes, because both relationships are equally important because the staff who have a good relationship with you, they will encourage the men and the women to come to your yoga class. So it will be a, a positive kind of ripple inside the prisons. Mm, thank you. Do you prefer silence or do you have a playlist supporting the yoga group? And are you using props? Mm, It's depending on where I am. If I teach inside a unit where it's like I'm in the unit where they live and they have a gym at the end of the hall and there's other guys are in the unit, then I have and there is no door. Then I have a music sometimes to create like a soundscape that this is our this is our yoga sphere, but it's really neutral. You know, it's no, I did a huge mistake many years ago to have someone singing in the background of the music. And it was a Muslim prayer 
And uh, of course, I'm facilitating multiple religions. So there was one guy, he's a Muslim, he was really reacting strongly to this is not supposed to be when we're practicing yoga. So after that, I was like, no, no singing inside, (laughs) only like instrumental, really just in the background. So sometimes I use that, but definitely not in the psychiatry units. And I'm trying to have a quiet space where we can move because it can be too distractive uh, and bring us out of the of, out of the kind of inner practice as well. Mm, thank you. I regularly teach in a women's facility in New York. I teach on a night that the women hear the decision affecting their parole. Many are denied and come to yoga very emotional and often cry throughout class. Feeling all of you um, in this response, can you provide some suggestion, suggestions to be supportive to the individual without drawing unwanted attention while still keeping the class progressing? I don't know. Sometimes, depending on the situation, and you can also ship in Blair if you have experience. I just feel that kind of allowing that to happen acknowledging that you are sad, like sadness, emotions are not anything we should be afraid of, like acknowledging I see you. And also I always talk to the women where I teach that, you know, it's fine for you to be angry, sad, frustrated and everything in a yoga class. It's all inclusive. It's okay to feel those emotions, but we, I normally move with the emotions. So if I see someone is sad, maybe, you know, starting to push things and see if you can move that kind of sense of frustration and grief uh, out of the body and into the body, like moving with it. Sometimes that can help be helpful, uh, but just acknowledging that, you know, you see them and, you know, you're there to hold the space, uh, the best of your best ability. I think sometimes that's enough that you're a human being that sees them in their grief, right? Sometimes words is unnecessary, but moving it has been pretty powerful and allowing it. Thank you. That's beautiful. If some of the asanas are too triggering, example, downward dog or a hip hip opener where you are on your back, um, positions that may be traumatic for those with complex trauma and um, sexual abuse or assault, how do you work around this? I have noticed that most programs focus on, um, on asana, but not everyone is able to access them or not access them yet. Yeah, certain poses I just don't do. And like cat cow, you can do cat cow sitting up. You get the same effect for the spine. Like you can modify a few things. Um, Triggering poses like hip opening poses at the end of the class. Um, Sometimes I can explain, you know, like now we have five minutes. So if you can move your body the way you would like to move here at the end, you know, it can be a twist, it can be a stretch, it can be legs up the wall, like when they have practiced for a while. So they have seen some options how you can move. Actually, quite a few women that I know coming from sexual abuse do hip openers on their own. They have chosen to do that. So I don't stop that, uh, but I don't teach it. So I'm trying to keep it as safe and uh, held as much as I can. And for the women who choose to do a hip opener, then they do like Supta Baddha Konasana with the feet together and the knees out. Sometimes I offer them, maybe you want to have a blanket over you that can be a little bit safe and warm. Like, so they choose to do that. Uh, but I don't, I don't, there is no need for me to kind of guide them into poses that can be potentially triggering because you never know what you're starting. And then you leave the prison and then it could kind of escalate. So I feel what we're having, like our mantra in the prison yoga project, maximize benefits and minimize harm. I think that's good to have in the back of the head. Do I really need to do cat and cow or downward facing dog if it's not landing well? Like we never know what's triggering, right? So I think it's, we can do many other things that's still beneficial. (laughs) Thank you. Do you notice that utilizing expressive dance movement uh, and therapy complements uh, and supports the yoga? Well, (laughs) I've been also facilitating dance classes inside the women's prison for 15 years. And we've been specializing in Bollywood dancing, Indian dancing from the movies. (laughs) And 
also we have been using expressive arts and move, dance movement therapy as an intervention on the side of the yoga for those who choose to go into into that uh, um, classes and it's been really 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 beneficial and James has been there doing the light bulbs with us in Sweden dancing with the, with the ladies so dance and yoga is a beautiful complement to work with together but make sure that they are choosing to go there so you don't put on loud music and kind of start mm-hmm. to dance without them agreeing to know what they're going to otherwise that can be also too much for some thank you do you feel lived experience is essential for yoga facilitators? It can be, but not necessary. It's depending on where you are and what experience. But I feel like lived experience weighs quite a lot when you work inside these environments because the people we work with are really kind of tuned in to who is it that comes in and are we talking from, are we walking our talk <laughs> in a way? So for me, it's been super helpful. But, you know, I also know many facilitators that come in that don't have that background and do a really beautiful work and really connect. So, I mean, it's, but it can help sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hear the paradox of it helping or also having it be quite heavy from a personal experience. Yeah, and and sometimes we need to be really aware of our own trauma triggers if we're coming from that background and not, you know, going into this kind of over helping rather than serving, because sometimes that can be a, I'm so eager to kind of help from my own experience that I'm kind of pushing away my own needs and my own self-care. So it's kind of a fine balance of, okay, I'm holding the space, I'm doing the work, but I also need to work with self-observation and sitting with my own trauma, my own reactions and how I let that play out in this as well, because it's multiple trauma reactions in a room when we're working like this. So we need to be centered and and uh, really grounded, I feel. I completely agree. And that you are not supplementing the transformation that you see and you, thinking that it's your own. Oh my God. No, no, no. It's not about us. (laughs) That's the beauty of the yoga practice. We can completely take ourselves out of the picture because it's the yoga practice who gives the benefits. It's, it's It's the relationship in the way of the group that I'm a part of the group when we're doing this practice, but I'm not there to, to, it's not my benefit. They are doing it on their own. And that's the beauty of this work. I don't, I can, I can just completely relax and don't have pressure on myself because the practice is doing it and they are doing it for themselves. That's the beauty of it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this next one, I feel like there's a couple of things that we can tie in here. I wonder if the prison system in Sweden or other countries who are researching and applying these modalities ever consult with the U.S. prison industry? Right now, there is a program called Little Scandinavia, and there's a trade with Sweden and Norway and the U.S. They're creating a new kind of prison system. I can't remember where it is, but yeah. I think San Quentin is where they're thinking. Also, yeah, there's another place as well. There's a Swedish documentary. They were in the prison where I teach and did part of the documentary. So they want to kind of collaborate the US and Sweden and Norway to kind of see if there's a new way of of implementing, you know, more of a kind of kind of Scandinavian style towards the pro- but the Scandinavian style is an air castle, it's not really working. So <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of over over <laughs> exclamated. <laughs> yeah. Will you will you dig a little deeper into that? Um, and it's yeah. and I don't think I don't think that you're speaking necessarily bad of a system, but like oh, no, everyone. About- this is a huge debate in the in our uh, in Sweden right now because we have the most mass shootings or gang related violence in the whole of Europe. We are considered to be the most dangerous country in Europe right now compared to capita. And our prisons are overcrowded. We have never had two in each room. Now we have that. Drug rehabilitation programs have been taken away. Uh, So the so-called Swedish model with rehabilitation and, you know, the so-called better out and criminal care, as it's called, is not really working because the staff is on their knees. We have too many people, overcrowded prisons, and the security is what they have to focus on because there's so much violence inside the prisons right now. 
So it's taking a step back and so hardly, very few gets good psychological help and healthcare help. So it's, it's like a, it's, it's moved backwards many, many, many steps as it was uh, compared to many years ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Have you encountered and experienced people who are triggered by being watched? I really like this question. Being in a prison context where there is surveillance and um, and observation, is it possible to cultivate a sense of privacy within the practice, even when living in this fishbowl? I really feel that we achieve that privacy where we are, uh, where we facilitate the classes. So we really make sure that When we facilitate the yoga, no one is going to come and disturb them. There is a camera um, that's watching them. But you kind of forget about the camera. We don't have guards in the room just watching. If there are guards in the room, they also practice. So there is another level of that. And if someone is coming in, we're not allowing that someone is just standing watching them because that could be a super trigger, of course, because you're kind of vulnerable. You're moving your body in different ways and... You know, and we make sure that no one is behind their backs. So they have the wall behind them. So no one can come and surprise you. And I am always at the door or the hallway. So I have, <laughs> I'm 150 centimeters. So I'm, I'm keeping the security for the guys who are like two meters tall, but it makes them relax because I am the one who kind of uh, tells people to go away if someone should come and disturb us. So it's very important, even though you are in that kind of surveilled environment, that you create some kind of safety. And here you also have where do you put your eyes, you're moving and you're breathing. It's so much going on that you kind of for a while forget that someone is watching you. That's the power of the practice. So we have so many things that we're focusing on that we're going from the external to the internal. And one guy, he explained that it's like I'm going inside my own house a little bit. So I'm closing the windows i'm closing the doors going into the room furthest in and no one can disturb you know Mm. that's beautiful thank you this is going to be our last question of our time together and then josephine i'll give you the floor just to speak to anything that hasn't been said for those of us who have complex trauma and who are system impacted perhaps even have been abused by police or mistreatment in jails and prison by staff. How do you know when or if we are ready to serve this population? Mm. How do we know? I think it's really difficult. Again, it's about that establishing a human connection and a human relationship with coming in with who we are doing the practices without being judgmental, offering this safe space, you know, I think. And then the person needs to decide themselves if they want to do this practice as well, if they feel safe enough in this. So it's really hard to know when a person is ready because I had many guys and women that I felt this might be super, super hard because they're so impacted by the system, but they really appreciated that, you know, the coming in as a facilitator like this, we are very human. Like just being there, not being that kind of superior um, force that you can encounter inside the prisons. We're trying to be very there and very present and very correct and respectful. Uh, So I think that over time will kind of provide some hope for a person like that if they come regularly. But it's very hard to know when, if there's a place and time where you don't do that. I think that's if someone is very aggressive and disturbing the others in the group and everything, but. Thank you. And I will give you the floor. If there isn't anything that's been talked about or discussed or anything that you want to share with our audience or any paths forward, it's yours. (laughs) Yeah, I just feel like, you know, the work that we do provides so much hope uh, for for the future, but it also provides so much hope for the society in a whole. Because if we see these kind of transformations in front of our eyes each week, in people that's been really coming from difficult backgrounds, and especially inside the forensic psychiatry, if we can see 
changes that can provide better mental health and you know better social interactions and a sense of belonging and an empowerment if we can see in this in this environments then you know for children for people on the outside it's just super hopeful so right now I'm in a children's yoga recording studio and I'm working with the children's yoga training which I've been doing on the side for many many years because it's so important to start working with this in time so we don't see so many inside the prisons because we know that the complex trauma issues are propelling this uh, pipeline into the prisons, right? So having that in mind when we talk about incarcerated people that, yes, we need to take responsibility for the crimes we have done and the pain we have caused others and themselves, but for us to be not judging and to see that these are little children from the beginning and things happen in life. You're not born into a criminal or so kind of evil, you know, but uh, you, to see that and not be so judgmental and to notice also in ourselves, like, do we want to be remembered for the worst thing we did in our life or, you know, to believe in the transformation, to see the hope uh, that these practices hold. Like that was so much, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, um, I find, uh, I feel it's so hopeful for the future, really. Thank you. It was an absolute honor to host you. I was so excited to have this opportunity. <laughs> I can't wait to have you back to talk about the results of all of these amazing yeah. Yeah. opportunities. Uh, so you can find Josephine Wickstrom on our Prison Yoga Project website. There's always opportunities to train maybe with her in Sweden or somewhere in Europe. She's also traveling next week to the Trauma Research Foundation offering a workshop at the conference with James Fox and Dr. Sam. Is it Dr. Sam? No, not Dr. Sam. But... <laughs> okay, it's Sam, it's yeah. Sam as well from Massachusetts PYP. Uh, so you can find them there. There are still virtual tickets available. We can drop the link uh, or you can also just Google Trauma Research Foundation and it will be one of the first links that pops up on their website. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening as well. And thank you, Blair. Thank you.